It works. Okay. We're going to go forward here with the lesson at this time. And we continue in the series on buy truth and do not sell it with make room for truth. If you uh, are able to make it back for 7 p.m. today, we'll be looking at Jehoshaphat in the court of Ahab. A lesson about Belgium. But for this morning, we're speaking of buy truth and do not sell it. Make room. What do we mean by make room for truth? Well, you have to have somewhere for truth to be. There, there has to be a place for truth to stand. You have to be willing to put up with it, if you will. And specifically, we look at 2 Corinthians 7 in verse 2, where the apostle says, Make room in your hearts for us. We've wronged no one. We've corrupted no one. We've taken advantage of no one. This he says in the midst of speaking with them about his reception as an apostle among them and about his uh, his teachings uh, in this in this place in Corinth. Let me move that. Out. Sorry. They perhaps were having trouble accepting that he was the, the apostle, that he was, that he had the authority that he did, or that, you know, that he was on the up and up. He had come from, you know, who knows where, I guess. If you're in the Greek city-states and this fellow shows up, begins to teach, you maybe are wondering about it. But this is the second letter. I mean, they had a first letter that, you know, they obeyed the gospel. They got a first letter. They repented. But even so, he still has trouble with them not respecting the word of God that's coming through him. And so he says these things to them, make room in your hearts for us. Uh, they just didn't have a place. They didn't have a reception, if you will. The apostles didn't have a reception with them, though they came and spoke the truth. And the word that they were speaking was being contradicted by false teachers among them at Corinth. And there were some problems, you know, people attacking their character. And yet the apostle says these things, we have wronged no one, first of all. Second, we have corrupted no one. And third, we have taken advantage of no one. And so in our uh, method of study, we're gonna take these uh, in their order and look at them. In the dictionary, when we speak of wronged, we've wronged somebody, we mean um, something injurious, uh, defrauding somebody, wronging somebody in the sense of, you know, the kind of thing that can be taken to court. Uh, that You have wronged them, you've injured them, you perhaps have been the source of their ruin or have defrauded them out of something. This is the meaning of this. It's an injustice. And he said, you know, make room in your hearts. We've wronged no one. It's not the case that something we have done here is harmful to other people. An example of the wrong is found in Acts 7, 24, where uh, it is recounted how Moses saw what was happening among the children of Israel, their mistreatment at the hands of Egypt. It says Moses saw one of them being wronged and defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. That one was being injured or some injustice was happening, perhaps being attacked, being um, uh, beaten or mugged or in some other way as life threatened, which he would have gotten away with by Egyptian law. But Moses avenged him and defended him. On the following day, he appeared to them as they were quarreling. Verse 26 continues. And he tried to reconcile them. So now two Israelites are quarreling. He said, men, your brothers, why wrong one another? So they were having a problem. They were being unjust with one another. And he tried to stop that too. He delivered them from the oppressor who was doing that. 
And now these two are fighting and he tries to reconcile them. But the one who was doing the wrong thrust him aside. That is to say, thrust Moses aside saying, who made you a ruler and a judge over us? To give you an idea of the injustice that we're talking about, that one really thought he was in the right. He thought he had the, uh, the rule here. Another example of wrong is found in Galatians 4. At verse 12, he said, I entreat you, brothers, become as I am. I become as you are. You did me no wrong. There was a time when they had received him so well. But then they had Judaizing teachers come through who wanted them all to be circumcised and to eat kosher and all the things that are part of that as conditions of forgiveness in Christ Jesus, which is not true. That's not an accurate representation of the law. And he said, you did me no wrong. You didn't treat me that way at first. But now, verse 15, you see, what then has become of your blessedness? I testify to you, if possible, you'd have gouged out your eyes and given them to me. Have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? They hadn't done him any wrong. But when this started to, to happen, there was this controversy among them where before they would have gouged out their eyes for him. Now he's become their enemy. Why? Because he told the truth. So the apostle said, make room in your heart for us. We have wronged nobody. They didn't do this. And if you are teaching the truth to others, you're not doing this either. Right? This comes down to how are you received when you teach the word? When we speak of buy truth and do not sell it, that's the meaning. What does it mean? You know, what is its value to you and what is the value you present to others? If you're using wrongdoing, if you're using pressures, uh, you know, human levers, if you will, earthly carnal means, you're not doing it right. That's not what the apostles did. When he says, we've corrupted nobody. This is the word thedo. This is the word that is used for uh, decay. So if you do this to something, if you cause a thing to decay, you are therefore destroying or wasting it. But if you do this to a person, you are corrupting them, perhaps with a bribe. Some kind of allure, an enticement, a trap, a perversion. Uh, seducing a person, ruining or spoiling a person is the meaning for corrupted. We've corrupted nobody. We haven't lured anybody, trapped anybody, corrupted the truth, uh, or rather perverted the truth. We haven't led to somebody's ruin or destruction. An example of this would be 1 Corinthians 3.17. If anyone destroys God's temple, which is your body, God will destroy him. God's temple is holy and you are that temple. And here, of course, he speaks about the fellowship of the saints, but he also speaks shortly in 1 Corinthians 6 uh, about the temple that is the body, which is made for the Lord and not for fornication. But if you are to corrupt or to destroy God's temple, then God will destroy you. There is such a thing as a corrupting or corrosive, decaying, spoiling, ruining, whatever you want to call it, influence. First Corinthians 15, verse 33, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. It's that word. And when he says this, of course, you know, uh, <laughs> the parents are always looking at their teenagers, but... Actually, in 1 Corinthians 15, the bad company that he's talking about is not the band. The bad company he's talking about is the people who are teaching the resurrection has already passed. Which is crazy. And they're still around. And they're still crazy. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Meaning you keep company with people who teach error your good morals are corrupted. You are being influenced and enticed, perverted and ruined and spoiled. But the apostles have not done this. 
Make room in your hearts for us. We have wronged nobody. We have corrupted nobody. And the big one, 2 Corinthians 11, 3. For corruption, how about this? The apostle says, I'm afraid. As the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and a pure devotion to Christ. That led astray is corruption. That's the corrupting influence, the spoiling, the ruining, the enticing, whatever you want to call it. You may recall that the devil came to her to draw attention to the one thing she could not have. Who said, well, did God say you should not eat of the fruit of the garden? Well, he already knew. That wasn't a legitimate question. He knew that. He was there to lead her astray, to corrupt her, to spoil her, to lead to her death, to her ruin. That's why Jesus called him a murderer. Did the apostles do this? No, that's not the way that they operated. They also said, we have taken advantage of no one. This word is a very interesting word, taken advantage. In the dictionary, it means to have more than one's due or to claim more than one's due, which is typically in a bad sense, meaning which would mean something like greedy. But it's to, ta to have more than your due, to claim, you know, you take too much on to yourself. You take too much credit, right? But the other thing would be to gain or to have some kind of an advantage over somebody, whether that be a larger share or um, a sounder legal claim or something like this. Uh, and eventually we are also talking about gain at the expense of somebody else, <laughs> which would be more like we would what we would call fraud, um, maybe Ponzi scheme, um, where you are gaining advantage at the expense of somebody else, right? This is the meaning of taking advantage. When he says, we have wronged no one, we have uh, corrupted no one, we have taken advantage of no one, this is what he's saying. We, we have not leveraged things against you. We have not taken on more than is right. An example of doing the wrong thing, taking advantage, would be 2 Corinthians 2, 11, uh, 10 to 11, where he writes about the gentleman who was discussed in 1 Corinthians 5, who had had his father's wife. He said, anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Indeed, what I've forgiven, if anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ so that we would not be taken advantage of by Satan. We are not ignorant of his designs. See, Satan would take advantage of us. He would perhaps outwit this says, but really saying he would get the better of us at our own expense. Um, that, you know, he would... Yeah, leverage us against one another to gain advantage. And that is true. If we have that sin of unforgiveness among us, we are going to be, you know, poked and prodded and leveraged by Satan. There's no question about that. Also in 2 Corinthians, at verse 12, or I'm sorry, chapter 12, you see the idea back to what we have been talking about, the apostles uh, going in and, uh, in and among them, teaching and um, the things that they have done and the things that they have not done. Precisely here, we're talking about the fact that they did not get paid. In 2 Corinthians 12, 16 to 18, Paul says, granting that I myself did not burden you, and that's a technical term. When you read the text, you can see that burden means I did not accept money from Corinth. I was crafty, you say, and got the better of you by deceit. Did I take advantage of you through any of those whom I sent to you? I urged Titus to go and sent the brother with him. Did Titus take advantage of you? Didn't we act in the same spirit? Didn't we take the same steps? What are we saying? Well, 
Now we're getting down to it, aren't we? What they're saying is, well, Paul himself didn't take money, but he still got it, just in a roundabout fashion. He took some off the top of what we paid this other fella or these other fellas or what we sent to Jerusalem or whatever, you know. This is what they're saying. Okay, so you you grant that I myself did not accept any pay. <laughs> but you still think that I was crafty and got the better of you by deceit. That when I sent other people, that they got support and that got funneled back to me somehow. That's what they're, that's what they're saying. It's very worldly, but, you know, that, that does happen in the world. There's no question about it. That happens in our government all the time. It happens in business all the time. That's not how the apostles are conducting themselves. They have wronged nobody. They've corrupted nobody. They've taken advantage of nobody. This is what he's talking about. They're saying, you know, that you have wronged us. You, you have come here to do your will. You've come here to gain advantage for yourself. You want the money so you can spend it on yourself or on your projects or whatever else it might be. That's what they're saying about him. And that's why he said what he did. Make room in your hearts for us. And this is talking, I think, about that kind of genuine love, that kind of genuine acceptance, that, that genuine trust that Christians should have one for another. We are working for the same God. We're working for the Lord. Um, and because we work for the Lord, we are honest in our dealings one with another. We make our intentions known. We don't have to assume um, about the motives of others and, and accuse one another. We can have room for one another. And he says this, make room in your hearts. And this word um, in the Greek is, yeah, actually the basis of this word, the kore there, uh, C-H-O-R-E, is... Um, is literally what we would call like three-dimensional space. It's the word that is used in choreograph. That's that's uh, writing down how the space is being used on stage, right? It's a chore. You're giving space, make room. There needs to be a place for it. This is being used for make room for another, give way or withdraw, give way to somebody. Um, but also to have room for something, to hold it or contain it, uh, frequently of measures, meaning they would use this with, um, you know, say a measuring cup. We we might say a four quart, but they would say it it makes room for four quart. <laughs> um, but it also has the idea of the capability of it. You have it within you to do this, we might say. Okay, so it's about having somewhere for this to be. Is it possible for somebody, as Paul is doing, to speak the truth selflessly? Can they do this? Is it possible for somebody to really genuinely be serving God and yet telling you some bad news sometimes? Where is that? Is there room for it? John 8, 37, Jesus told those who believed in him, I know you're offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. That means my word does not have room inside of you. You have made no room for my word. There's no place for it to stay. There's no place for it to stand. That's not a thing that you will accept. It's not a thing you think exists right? It's not, there's no schema for it. <laughs> Lots of ways of talking about this. But Jesus said, you are trying to kill me because my word finds no place in you. And that's the idea of make room. We have also 2 Peter 3, verses 8 through 9. On this idea of making room, this is a good one. He said, 
Do not overlook this one fact, beloved. With the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some think that he is, but rather he is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should have room for repentance. That's what he's doing. God is making room in our lives for repentance. He is definitely in our corner. He wants us to do well. He makes it possible for us to do well. Any argument that people cannot reach repentance, that they, they can't know the truth or they can't learn the truth, is clearly false because God is not willing for any to perish, but rather wishes for all to have room to repent. So it's not the case that anybody has no shot at forgiveness. That doesn't exist. God makes sure that they can be forgiven if they want to be forgiven. He makes room for repentance, that we can reach it. Okay, so anyway, that is to say, these are the definitions of the things that we are talking about in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 2. Make room in your hearts for us. We have wronged no one. We've corrupted no one. We've taken advantage of no one. See, the messengers of God, um, and as I said before, that includes you. <laughs> the messengers of God are often ill-received in this way. People don't believe. We sometimes don't want to believe that somebody is speaking to us genuinely out of the goodness of their heart, that somebody really is trying to serve God when they accept wrong against themselves, when they accept mistreatment against themselves, when they, uh, you know, foot the bill on your behalf. People always think, not always, but people often think, oh, that one's after something. Well, I hope that it always is the case that you are after the forgiveness of God in the life of the person you're talking with. I hope you do want people to be saved, to be forgiven as you are forgiven. But nothing more than that. I hope you don't hope you're not looking for gain in some way. But this is the problem that the apostles faced, and we face this today as well. So you be sure that you do not wrong people. You don't do injustice. Be sure that you are not enticing, luring, perverting watering down perhaps the truth to make it more palatable. Be sure that you are not doing this for personal gain, that you're not leveraging people against one another or in some other way being sneaky about it for personal advantage so that people who do have room for the truth will hear the truth that you speak and will look to the God to whom you, you point them when you teach. That's what we want. But the children of God are often under attack and often accused in these ways. It's a pattern in scripture. And when you see it, you can recognize it and understand what, what that is. There's a basic distrust there of the apostle Paul. Despite the teaching that he has done, the uh, faith to which they have become obedient, the repentance that uh, he helped them to with his first letter. Despite all of these things, they still have, they're still harboring this distrustfulness of his motives, distrustfulness of his operations. Why is he doing this? Why is he saying this? And that's why we read what we do here. You make some room. Look at what we've done. We haven't wronged anybody. We haven't corrupted anybody. We haven't taken any advantage. Give Paul a chance, right? Give truth a chance. <laughs> Listen to the truth of God in your life and try to find people who will listen when you are teaching the truth as well. All right. So that is 
the end of that particular topic, which admittedly is a little bit shorter than the other ones, but so be it. Uh, we'll continue in that series, uh, you know, at the next opportunity. But today we talk about the things that we close with over in Second Peter 3. You know, God wants everybody to be forgiven. He does want us to reach repentance and to have salvation. If today you're not a Christian, become a Christian that you might have forgiveness in God's sight. All of us are from time to time overtaken in something, have had trouble in life. I certainly needed to obey the gospel when it came to my attention. And uh, since that time also have needed the prayers of the saints. If today you are not a Christian, we'll help you to obey the gospel. We will find the water that you might be baptized in the name of Christ Jesus for forgiveness of sins. But if today as a Christian you haven't lived right, well, you've got to repent, make things right with God, consider the things that the scriptures have for all of us, myself included, and repent. Pray God for forgiveness. And if we can pray on your behalf that you might be restored to him, we'll do that too, because none of us is above temptation. If you need our prayers or need to be baptized, let it be known while we sing the song selected.